Good morning. So good to see you this morning. Got my purple on for the Wiley Little League. It says purple, isn't it, Libby? I'm colorblind, so I don't know sometimes. Uh, we have ties to the Wiley Little League. I don't know if y'all knew that. Brent Kofer's grandkids play on that team. And one of them is becoming world famous, Ella Bruning, who in my opinion is the best catcher in this whole World Series. So it's exciting to watch her. Uh, also, Blaze Ruffin is a part of that group, who's one of ours here, who unfortunately got hurt right before the World Series. Uh, he is a fantastic player. So they're all at Williamsport. I think they may be tuning in this morning, so uh, we're going to cheer them on this afternoon. Also, if you're noticing some strange guy walking around with a camera, that's Ripple of Light. And so they're getting footage for our website and advertising, other things. They've done that before in the past. We needed to update some of that. Uh, Cade was wanting to fly a drone over the congregation. No kidding, he really wanted to, but I said, eh, that might be a little distracting, so uh, he's just going to walk around with a camera. We're starting a new series this morning. I always feel like this Sunday in August is kind of the start of the new year. I know it's the start of school for kids, for parents, but it's also kind of the beginning of the year for us as everybody comes back together and you know we start off the season of school and activities, and so I wanted to focus on family this morning. And my hope and prayer is that we can lay a foundation that we can build on, not just through this series, but even after this series in your daily life. And I want to start with the foundation, of course, because that's where it always starts. And then we build on that foundation. This morning, we're looking at the idea of God being first. I know that's so cliche, and we talk about it all the time, but saying it and doing it, as you know, can be two very different things. It's one thing to know what to do, it's something else to do what we know. And so we're starting this morning by looking at God's purpose for the family. And one of the first things that I try to do when I sit down to do a sermon or a series is I try to come up with a sermon starter. So maybe a a cute illustration, a story, a joke, something to set the tone and make you want to tune in for the next 25 minutes or so. And yes, I realize I fail in that endeavor most of the time. However, as I was thinking about this sermon and and a way to kickstart it, I ran across an article online entitled, Pastor Decides to Try for Fifth Kid Just for the Sermon Illustrations. (laughs) The article states, Pastor Nathan Dursky and his wife Savannah confirmed in a message to their congregation Sunday that they have decided to have a fifth kid simply to increase the number of sermon illustrations and cute anecdotes the minister will have to draw on during his messages each and every week. The couple made the decision after realizing their current kids were starting to grow out of the adorable sermon illustration phase and into the angsty, rebellious pastor's kid phase. We're not having another kid because of God's command to fill the earth, he said, or because they bring a lot of joy, or because we're one of those weird Duggar people. Dursky said in a congregational meeting, we just want to be clear that we're doing this solely for the sermon illustrations. According to Dursky, every child that a minister fathers is worth at least four or five dozen sermon illustrations. Our third kid was a real gold mine. I was getting an illustration or cutesy sermon intro out of him just about every Sunday. He further stated that his oldest was a little bit of a disappointment since the boy stubbornly refused to say many insightful or adorable things, even when offered bribes. I should tell you that article appeared in the Babylon Bee, which some of you know is satire or truly fake news. Still, I thought it was hilarious, and it has convinced Libby and I to have another kid, so uh, that's not true. Kids provide us with an endless array of illustrations, right? They make us laugh, they teach us things, they bring to light things that maybe we never thought about before, they stun us sometimes and amaze us with their intellect, but our hope should be that they model not just us, but more importantly, Jesus Christ as they grow into adulthood. Remember earlier this year when we talked about marriage, I showed you this picture. This is our family portrait, been a few years ago. This is our family portrait. All of you, more than likely, have one of these in your house. You don't have this one. That'd be weird. But you have a family portrait 
somewhere in your home more than likely. It may be hanging uh, above the, the fireplace. It may be positioned somewhere else in the house. You may have one in your office. But most, if not all of us, have a family portrait in our home. My guess is none of you have a family portrait that is blurry or out of focus. You would never think of hanging or displaying a blurry or out of focus family portrait in your home. You'd never pay for that, right? No, when we take a family portrait, we dress up, we dress similar. Some of you put on makeup. You you try to look your best. You comb your hair. You want to present your best because this is the photo that people are going to look at when they come in your home, and this is the photo that you want them to see you at, their, at your best, right? This represents your family at its best. Well, when it comes to having a godly family, the family portrait that we exhibit is being an image bearer to the world around us. Unfortunately, We have turned the secondary into the primary. We have made the ancillary the primary. And what I mean by that is we often see the goal of family as happiness. You know, have have a bunch of little lookalikes that that make you happy. You know, they grow up to be well-adjusted, good kids that make good grades, get a good job. We see that with with marriage, too. We, We kind of you know, exhibit marriages as, as if it's supposed to be happy and, and, and that's what it's all about. You just, you get married and you pursue happiness the rest of your life. But nowhere in the Bible is happiness presented as the goal. Nowhere in Scripture does it say that the goal of marriage or the goal of family is to be happy. Happiness is not the goal. Holiness is the goal. The family portrait that hangs in your house is meant to be a visible photograph of God. That's what family is. It's a visual representation of God. When people look at my family, hopefully they see a representation and manifestation of the God who created this little family. We have made the benefit the goal. The goal is displaying the image of the Creator to the world around us. The goal is living righteously. The goal is to live a life of holiness. Our families should be little bastions of holiness and righteousness. As Christian parents, we have a responsibility to do what the Israelite parents were commissioned to do, which is to teach diligently our children what it means to live in a covenant relationship with the Almighty God. And we can learn a lot from the Israelite parents because they failed miserably in that endeavor, right? Shortly after entering the promised land, they forgot about their covenant with God and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Let's not make the same mistake. Let's not make happiness the goal. Let's let happiness be the byproduct of the goal, which is holiness. A family was heading home from church. They had had a a prayer for all the babies that, that morning at church. One of the elders stood up and he prayed for all the new little babies that had come into the world. And, and one of those families was driving home with their new little baby and also their five-year-old son who was weeping bitterly in the back seat. And mom and dad tried to get it out of him what was wrong. He wouldn't talk. Finally, he came clean. He said that elder said that he wanted us to grow up in a godly home but I want to stay with you guys. <laughs> Ouch, right? That stings a little bit. That's what we should hope for for all of our families, right, is that they grow up in a godly home. How do we ensure that that happens? How do we ensure that our children grow up in a godly home? Notice I didn't say, how do we ensure that our children will be faithful for life? Because I didn't say that because you can't guarantee that. You know, you'd like to, but you can't. As we're going to talk about later in this series, you can't make your children be faithful for life. They have free will. They can do their own thing when they grow into adulthood. They make the decision whether they're going to build on this foundation that you started in the home. But what you can do is you can make certain that your home is focused completely on God, that that your family is focused on holiness and not just happiness. There is a bigger purpose for the family, and we see it from the very beginning. All too often, family reflects what society values. 
And so you look at a family and you get insight into the world. It's just an extension of the world. And, and a lot of the things that the world values are good things. They're not necessarily bad things. But if you look at the world, you see that you know, the world oftentimes values you know, academic success, athletic success, or you know, making a lot of money, you know, having a lot of wealth so you can retire early. Whatever, whatever the world values, some of it is good stuff. And I would say that our families, by and large, especially our families here at Oldham Lane, value good things. But as, again, we want to make sure that we're not making the secondary the primary. We want to make sure we're not making the sideshow the main event. And so when it comes to family and living in a godly home, we need to understand the bigger purpose. And God sets that forth from the very beginning. Genesis 1, Royce read from it a moment ago. Then God said... Let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. God established his authority over the family by his mere creation of it. And why did he create family? We, us, were made in the image of the Almighty God. He created us, male and female, in his image, in the image of the Trinity. Did you catch that? That's the us that he is talking about. When God said, let us make man in our image, he's referring to God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's the us. We were made in their image, and we cannot afford to rush by this because this is what defines the us, the purpose of family. God said, let us make man in our image, male and female, offspring, family. Let us make them look like us. So from the very beginning, from the onset, the goal was for man to be a mirror. That's it. That's the bigger purpose. We were made to be akons. Akon is the Greek word for representation and manifestation. It is associated with being an image bearer. It closely resembles our word for icon and for good reason, because that's where it comes from. Paul makes a reference to this in 1 Corinthians 15, 49. Just as we have borne the image of the earthly, we will also bear the image of the heavenly. The idea associated with Akon in this passage is that of representation and manifestation derived from a a prototype. So we are a prototype of the original. We may look like Adam, but we were made to be image bearers of God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit. So God created mankind individually to mirror Him. And when two image bearers come together in a marriage, that doesn't change our purpose, does it? In fact, you would think it would make it stronger. You would think that when two people, two image bearers come together, we would shine even more brightly as we live out the bigger purpose for a family. So what if a married couple decides to be fruitful and multiply? What does that do to the quality or the resolution of our image? Well, it should make it even brighter, right? Now we have this little little bastion of righteousness and holiness that shines brightly, that illuminates the character of Jesus that bears the image of a holy God? You see, wouldn't it stand to reason that the purpose of a family is to be a grouping of acons who reflect the image of the Almighty in the world? Again, verse 28 of Genesis 1, God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. What's God telling Adam and Eve? He's telling them to go and fill the earth with me. Go and fill the earth with me. Go and have a bunch of lookalikes who fill the earth. And even though they may look like you, they bear the image of me, right? They look like God. They may be doctors. They may be lawyers. They may be sanitation workers. They may be cashiers. Whatever their role in life may be, first and foremost, they are image bearers. They are living, breathing representations and manifestations of God in the world around them. You know what the goal of family is? This right here. 
This is the goal of family, to be a mirror. That's what you should be striving for individually in your daily life. It's what you should be striving for as husband and wife. It's what you should be striving for as a holy alliance in marriage and raising your kids in a bigger purpose for, is to be a mirror, to bear the image of God in a world that so desperately needs to see something holy. The goal of family is to be a visible portrait of God. And that was the goal from the very beginning. We all know about before and after pictures, don't we? You see before and after pictures on these late night infomercials as they're trying to get you to buy a particular piece of exercise equipment or start a new diet or maybe uh, drink some milkshake three times a day. So the, the goal of before and after pictures is to show you photo evidence that this product works. So you have the before, and it's a person who maybe weighs a little more than they want to, and then you have the after photo, which shows that they lost like 40 pounds in two days from drinking this milkshake or whatever, right? And then in, in tiny little print, like two-point font, you see the words, results may vary, which basically means you're not going to look like that, so don't get excited. You're not going to lose 100 pounds in three days by having this belly shaker attached to your, to your uh, belly. But, you know, that's, that's kind of what the, the plan is. We want to show you a before and after so that you buy in, so that you want to purchase this product, and maybe you'll seek to have similar results. They don't care as long as they got your money, right? But that's the whole goal. Well, God shows us a before and after picture in the Bible. He shows us the before picture, which is the ideal purpose and, and, you know, reason for family. And then he shows us the after picture. Rarely do you see an after picture that's worse than the before. That wouldn't bode well for the advertiser, right? However, God shows us the before picture to show us what was meant to be. And then he shows us the after to show us how it turned out because they didn't follow his plan. Look at Genesis chapter 2. Beginning of verse 7, it says, Then the Lord God formed the man out of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living person. The Lord God planted a garden toward the east in Eden, and there he placed the man whom he had formed. Out of the ground the Lord God caused every tree to grow that is pleasing to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So you have the before photo, right? You have the idea. Man was in perfect relationship with God, living in paradise. But I want you to notice something else here. Notice that before God gave Adam a wife, he gave him a place to live, and he gave him a job, and he gave him food. And I point this out because I want you to see that, that Adam's identity wasn't found in his sexuality. Adam's identity was found in his relationship with God. It was all about living in God's world and living in communion with God. It was a relationship that defined Adam. Families function best when God is first. Keep reading with me, verses 15 and following. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and tend it. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may freely eat, but from the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for on the day that you eat from it you will certainly die. So before Adam is blessed with the wife... He's blessed with a place to live, he's blessed with a job, he's blessed with food, and now he's blessed with a command, right? So before there was ever family, there was God. Keep reading. Then the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every animal of the field and every bird of the sky and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called a living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the livestock and to the birds of the sky and to every animal of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper suitable for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man and he slept. 
Then he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. And the Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. The man then said, at last this is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And for this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked, but they were not uh, ashamed. So we have the first problem. There's, there's trouble in paradise. Everything up to this point had been good. Now we see something that's not good. And what's not good is the fact that man is alone. And so God remedies that problem by creating woman, right? So now man and woman have a perfect home, a perfect relationship with God, perfect relationship with the Heavenly Father. What could go wrong, right? Well, I think we know. The after picture we call the fall. I call it paradise lost, but whatever you call it, the fact that Adam and Eve ate from the wrong menu guaranteed that we would all come from a broken home. Now, I'm not suggesting original sin here that we pay for the sins of Adam and Eve. I'm suggesting, no, I'm saying that we endure the consequences of the fall, right? Their actions cause collateral damage that we deal with up to this day. No more perfection, no more feeling uh, unashamed. And the reason, of course, is because no more sinlessness. Adam and Eve failed to keep the first rule of paradise, which is God first. That was the first rule. They broke the first rule, and it cost them dearly. Look at Genesis chapter 3. Now the serpent was more cunning than any animal of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God really said you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, From the tr- fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said you shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. The serpent said to the woman, you certainly will not die, for God knows that on the day you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will become like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took some of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves waist coverings. From the very beginning... Satan attacks the family. He goes after the family, and he does so by casting doubt on the Word of God. And notice who he goes after. He goes after Eve. He goes after the woman because he wanted to reverse things. He wanted to make her the leader, right? And so he attacks her, and it worked. The devil's voice became the loudest in her life, and, and, and two things resulted, right? Shame and blame. Shame was the instant result of not putting God first. And shame manifested itself in exposure. Although they were the only two people on earth, because of their sin, they were now naked and afraid. And what do you do when you're ashamed, when you're naked and afraid? What do you do? Well, you you run and hide, don't you? Notice verses 8 and 9. Now they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? Who does God cry out to? Not Eve. To Adam. Why? Well, because Adam was the man there. He was the leader in this little household. He was the head of this little household, he was, he was ultimately responsible. He was, he was right there when Eve took a bite. He was supposed to protect his family from the devil. God knew where Adam was, understand. It wasn't like he was asking because he didn't really know where Adam was. He knew where Adam was, but he needed Adam to understand where he was. He needed Adam to understand why this whole thing happened. That's why I asked the question, why are you, where are you, Adam? It was important for Adam as the head to know what sin leads to. This is what happens when you don't man up. But there's something else here that we can't afford to miss. Jesus is in the garden. Did you notice that? You see, after their sin, Adam and Eve try to cover themselves, but their covering was inadequate. And so God gives them a little higher-end clothing. And what does he give them to cover themselves? He gives them animal coverings. 
And we've talked about this over and over again, how the Old Testament has pictures and snapshots of, of the coming Christ. We see Jesus throughout the Old Testament. We see archetypes and shadows of the coming Messiah, and you see it right here. You can't get animal skins without shedding the blood of an animal. And one day, of course, sin would be covered by the blood of Christ. He's there, even in the midst of the first sin. Shame is often the result of sin. But there's something else. There's often blame coupled with shame. Playing the blame game is a rather natural response for the prideful individual. Eve blamed the serpent. Adam blamed, well, the woman, but he also blamed God, didn't he? The woman you gave to be with me, God. If you hadn't created her, none of this would have happened. And of course, what Adam should have said was, my bad. That's the only appropriate response. What he should have said is, my fault. I was there, I should have put a stop to it. I should have stepped in and done something about this, right? He was the first Akon. He was created to rule and reign. That was his job. Look at it again. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every crawling thing that crawls on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. It's not a, it's not a popular idea in our culture today but God established leadership in the home and in the church with man. That doesn't mean that woman never has any sort of leadership role. It just means that the buck stops with man. That's the biblical order of things. That's how it was set up. And I firmly believe that the family functions best when it functions as God designed it. You can argue with me on that, but I, I believe as a minister and a counselor, I can point to a plethora of examples that show this to be true. With shame often comes blame. We were made to rule and reign over creation, meaning that we were to have dominion over all of this. God gave mankind an assignment to rule over the earth as his image bearers, to fill the earth with his glory. Adam allowed a serpent to have dominion. He allowed a snake to be in control. That wasn't the order of things. God created Adam to rule and reign over all things, including the lowly serpent. And he allowed him to slither in and have dominion over him instead of the other way around. And in the end, there was no one else to blame but himself. My friends, this is us. The fall has affected humanity, all of humanity since. But hopefully we learn from them. We learn that our family should have a God-first mentality. Our family must be completely bought into our purpose, which is to be image bearers. Husbands and wives, fathers and mothers must know their role and live out that role effectively. And our family must let God's voice be the loudest in their home and in their lives. William Cowper was a rounder. You know what a rounder is? That's someone who lives a very immoral life. Someone who uh, dabbles or completely immerses themselves in immorality. And that was William Cowper. But he had an encounter with Jesus and it turned his life around. He became all in and invested in discipleship. He was able to have the opportunity to be a clerk in the House of Lords in Great Britain. However, he learned that before he could get the job, he would be exposed to a public examination. And he was scared to death. He just knew that during this public examination, all the things that he did in the past would come up and he would be completely embarrassed and ashamed, and he didn't want to face that. Even though he had turned his life around, he knew that no one would want a part of him being a clerk in the House of Lords if they knew his past. And so he decided that the only recourse was to kill himself. So he goes to the top of a, a very tall bridge with the intent of jumping to his death, but he learns that he's scared of heights. And so he decides that he's going to take some poison. He buys the poison. As he's walking home, he drops it, and it shatters on the ground. He decides he's going to hang himself. And so he ties the rope around his neck and attaches it to a beam. But when he kicks the chair out that was holding him up, the beam breaks. 
So he takes a knife. He's going to stab himself to death, but the blade breaks. True story. He's so frustrated that he can't even kill himself that he decides just to go to sleep. And when he wakes up, he has a song in his heart. And he decides to write it down. And I want us to sing it this morning. It's a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunge beneath that blood. thankful that William Cowper didn't end his life. I'm thankful that he wrote those words down. Redeeming love shall be my theme and shall be till I die. Think about that. William Cowper went to that public examination and before people could start grilling him, he just came clean. He told everyone that was there to interrogate him what he had done, all the gory details of the immoral life that he had led, and then he told them about the redeeming love that has been his theme from that point forward. And many people in the audience that day wanted to know more about Jesus Christ. He got the job, and he helped to make some disciples in the process. I know we've had our black sheep moments in our families. All of us individually have been the black sheep at one point or another in God's family, right? You may be a black sheep this morning. You may have walked into this building thinking the roof's going to cave in because it's been so long since I've been to church. I want you to know this morning that there's a fountain. And if we can help you in any way, I hope you'll come forward as we stand and as we sing.